The Bill of Rights, ratified December 15, 1791. Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. I, I would say, listen, the, the conditions were, so people came to protest what they believed to be an unfair or a stolen election. Fine. Yeah. As an American, I love that we can say what we think in, a, in an ostensibly in a safe way. So a lot of people gathered together on this day the location was deliberate because the decision about the election was being made just down the way. Um, and that, I don't know if a fourth grader would get all this, but I think the conditions were set for, for violence to occur. There was a growing group of people that were very un, unsettled and there was an emotional response that was incited directly and indirectly by the president of the United States at the time. And uh, it led to this, it led to the violence. It led to an attack on our own soil by our own people and people died. And it, it was unthinkable prior to that. And I don't know. It makes me emotional to even try to think about explaining it in the future. I mean, it, it ultimately made me feel angry, but um, my main response was frustration at the fact that this could even happen and I I think I don't really remember the time frame but I remember going to work after that and talking to some of the um, more conservative patrons that are at the pool and um, and just kind of stating my opinion that if you were had any part of that or supported any of the events that happened there you're not a good person and it's you're, like like you're not for actual uh betterment of the country you're just supporting some chaos that doesn't need to happen like it's just so it was nice to have those conversations with sort of like-minded people among conservatives, but um, yeah, I did lose a lot of contact with a lot of um, people. Well, it wasn't a lot. It was a few. <laughs> um, a few people through Facebook. People like unfriended me after I posted. Um, just a status that was saying if you support anything that happened in the events then I don't really want to associate with you anymore and I did lose a few friends that way um, but you know it is what it is I prefer not to associate with anyone that supports <sighs> uneducated chaos Well, I had a conversation with someone and I said it was, I, I, I referred to what was going on as, as like a siege at the Capitol. And someone was saying to me, that's not what it is. That it's just a, a bunch of protesters. I was like, how can you watch this on television right now and tell me that it's not? 
Like it's, it's, it's people who are not getting their way, <laughs> almost being directed by someone, the former president, um, maybe inadvertently, but being directed to do, to do something, to try and take matters into their own hand, right? And it's just, so anyway, I was having that conversation with this person and, um, and this is why I don't engage in these conversations about to politics is because, or just anything relating to politics in any way, because how can you not watch that as an American and, and be disappointed, right? Doesn't matter what, you know, what party you identify by or who you voted for, whatever. It just, you know, and, and, and then I wonder too, you know, I wonder because, you know, I, I, and I, and this is where like, I try to be open to things. Like I read, um, I read a lot of stuff that was talking about like Biden supporters and like the, some of the protests that were going on before Biden was elected. And um, what would have happened if Trump won again? Would things have been like, cause then you look at both sides of it. Those guys, those people were pr probably not sane, first of all, but right to do what they did. But then what would have happened if Trump won? Would there have been more protests? Would there like, no, no. In my opinion, there comes, there's another line with that where you can protest for what's right. Like for instance, like Black Lives Matter and then people who take advantage of a protest like that by looting stores and, and disrupting businesses that maybe had nothing to do with what was going on. But there's a difference between peaceful protests and then people who just are wanting to rebel and take things, you know? So that's, that's the conversation that I'm, that I had. Well, it wasn't, okay, it wasn't so much of a conversation if it, but it was more like, and I kind of mentioned this when we first, when you first reached out, but I, someone that I went to high school with was posting that he was on social, like that he was at the Capitol. And he spent like the whole like week following the insurrection, like posting about his experience and like trying to like rally more people to like continue to like, incite violence and he has a decent amount of followers like i think he has like twenty thousand followers or something like that so he isn't even like a quiet voice like i think he even launched his own version of parlor like a social media app or something like that but he went like on tangents and it was and then i i look back at his post like even before and he was like preparing for it was almost like he was preparing for war. Um, so that was really like, that made me super uncomfortable. And I was like, I can't believe, like it just, it kind of validated my life experience growing up in small town Pennsylvania, because I was like, I can't believe I know someone who went there and like did that and thought it was not only okay, but like the right thing to do. And the people who weren't doing that were like sheep and falling in line. And like, that was what, that like validated my life experience, if that makes sense. Because I was like, I knew the people from my town were nuts. Like I knew it. <laughs> so I screenshotted all of his posts and sent it to the FBI because I was like, and he was like posting stuff and like tagging DC. And so people were like commenting on his posts and like tagging the FBI too. So I'm like, I'm not the only person who, who sent his information to the FBI. But like, he ended up getting arrested, like I think two weeks, af maybe a month after. And he got posted on the home homegrown terrorist Instagram account that blew up. And it was like, that was kind of crazy. And I was like, I can't believe I know this person and that we like hung out in high school. Like that's nuts to me. Um, but yeah. Well, uh, you know, there's a, a third factor here 
between uh, free speech and free market. You know, I mean, hate speech, yeah, I mean, hate speech can be covered by free speech. You know what I mean? I remember years ago, there was a test case where um, these Nazis, and this is uh, going back to like maybe the 70s where these this Nazi group wanted to march through a, a Jewish neighborhood, uh, you know, in Illinois, it's uh, outside of Chicago, and um, the ACLU defended the Nazis. Uh, for their right to free speech, and there was a there was a Jewish lawyer who did it. Um, but I think in today's world we get caught up with like hate speech, and they're claiming their rights to free speech. But there's also the um, the venues, and the venues are privately owned and uh, respond more to market forces. So. You know, you you might want to say something on a television show, but the television show has to um, attract an audience. You know, it has to, uh, you know, be able to sell advertising time to sponsors. So, you see, that's more of a question of free market. So, yeah, yeah, but it's... It's, it's a confusing issue, you know? I mean, there's hate speech and you're free. You're free to say whatever you want. The government isn't gonna come down on you, but you might actually be censored. You might be censored on a privately owned platform. When I saw social media of leaders of small companies, um, state legislatures, um, you know, um, yeah, I don't know, like people that you wouldn't expect to be doing something like that. I, I would, I would respect like a rebel group. Um, you know, I would expect like a rebel group or, or like conspiracy theorists, that group to be made of conspiracy theorists, but to look at the news and see that Rudy Giuliani, um, members of Congress, um, members of, um, you know, successful and thriving businesses in other regions like Southern food stores, right? Just for instance, state legislatures from state legislators from like uh, West Virginia and Michigan going down and participating. Members of the House of Representatives uh, kind of being seen in uh, speaking at the rally before this transpired. It just confirmed my thoughts of like, this is a, this is a collab, this is a corroborated effort, um, you know, and there's conversations that are obviously being had, small groups and secret meetings, um, you know, that are putting the security of not only our political system but <clears throat> our our country right at risk for the sake of rooted in rooted in the idea of like, hey, we've got to do whatever we can to maintain, um, you know, a racial power as a majority. And that was really bothersome, right? And, and when I saw that these were elected leaders, this is crazy. Ah, what? Wow. Like I tried hard at that moment to not do too much media, social media, because it's like, <clears throat> boy, I'm gonna get hot and I'm gonna say something and I know I can't do that. <laughs> um, I, I think it, I think I would describe it as a day that I believe has changed politics for at least a generation. Um, that I think it finished the job of disrupting any 
but well, I think Biden has kind of like reintroduced some of the norms and behaviors and, you know, like protocols um, of the office. I think that January 6th has let, let it be known that it's okay. You can, you can <laughs> try to overthrow the government um, or it, it, at a minimum, and you know, let's even take the conservative route of it wasn't overthrowing the government. It was just trying to like, you know, get attention. Well, there were people in there looking to kill representatives and senators and the vice president, right? And to the fact that so little has been done for those people to account for what they did. I think it is, I think it is a green light moment um, in our history that I, I think will affect us, like I said, initially for the next, you know, at least the next generation. Um, I would, it, and you know, and more, you know, concretely, I would describe it as a day that, um, I think we'll, surprise, it, it depends on who you are, but I think it's surprised, shocked, confirmed, a lot of those things for a lot of other people of what our country really is, in a sense, that, um, and it's becoming, to, to, to me, it was like, yeah, like another step of showing just how, I mean, we've talked about division in this country for, you know, decades now, but, you know, short of the Civil War, I don't, you know, and I know there've been like horrific moments before where we've been divided, but, you know, short of actually having a civil war, I feel like it's almost like a cold civil war right now, right? Like everything is like a powder keg, everything is, uh, you know, and I'm hopeful that we can turn it around before, you know, snowballs out of control but I just feel like that January 6th it, it, it is like this milestone on this trajectory of you know we are so divided that if we don't like the results of the election no matter what evidence there is or isn't that there was fraud um we are still going to go and try to overthrow our leaders because we don't like what they're you know we don't we don't like what we're being told essentially I remember thinking, you know, I don't know how much you know about Seattle's last summer, um, but right outside of my apartment building after the protest became the Chop Chaz. And, uh, and it was awful. It was terrible. Um, you know, I've, I've served in the military. I was in combat for 12 months. Um, kind of felt like an insurgency with like, much, much higher stakes and no leadership. Um, but I remember when the police came back and how great that felt and how calm the neighborhood became. And, you know, there weren't people getting shot outside. There weren't people using IV drugs outside of our apartment. You know, there weren't burning cars, burning trash or anything like that. But I remember this came up in conversation with a couple of friends and I said you know one of the things that I'm really happy about is that Seattle police came back in the East Precinct and because that was in stark disagreement with with their ideology because they hadn't lived there and bless their hearts you know I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody <laughs> um, you know they blocked me on social media. They blocked my number. All because, you know, there was a little more peace and order in the neighborhood. And that's not to say that I disagreed with, with the Black Lives Matter movement or anything like that. Just making an open-ended statement, having the cops back, a little more order to the neighborhood. Sure. Oh, I mean, like, all the time living in Seattle. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not the best conservative, but I'm certainly not the best liberal at all. You know, I kind of fall somewhere in the middle. But the thing is, you know, I look like a cop. I'm covered in tattoos that are covered now. I very obviously was in the military. 
at first glance. You know, I drive a pickup truck. You gotta be, you gotta be careful in a city that is so, dare I use the word, extreme. In, in their openness to discord, I would say. Patriotism is a very loaded question for a Spaniard. Um, I remember coming to America and being terrified by the amount of flags, their rabid patriotism, uh, and coming from a country that had gone through a civil war um, in which alliance to a flag and to a set of principles was equated with fascism. So once we, uh, once Franco left and um, took in any way talk about, you know, the motherland in any kind of loving terms was seen as a fascist move. And it took me a long time to come here. I, I remember being very thrown off every single time somebody would like bring out the flag and say, talk about uh, America, it's the best place in the earth. And I would be like, oh, what is going on? That's fascist propaganda. I mean, after a while, I started to realize that there is a difference. You know, I came here very young. I was 16 when I came here. Um, so uh, I think patriotism now uh, is aspirational. First of all, I don't think we, we are there. But I view patriotism as a desire to create a supportive community within artificial boundaries. I think it's important that it is considered a responsibility that you take upon yourself that is not imposed, um, that it is outward, that it is something you owe to somebody, to a community, not something a community owes to you, and that we understand there is an artificial boundary and that we have created. And because we have created them, if needed, they have to be modified or they can be modified. I think the moment that we start to get very rigid um, and we start to talk about, you know, outside forces that create this um, unique a group of people and you start glorifying the group of people above other human beings, you start running into trouble. So that's what patriotism is for me now. Uh, for me, uh, I think when I imagine accountability as a healthy practice, as a healing practice, I think it has to be done by people who are in relationship. So I come from a tradition that believes that if someone wrongs you, you seek to mend because they are your sibling. So there's an assumption here of proximity. They might not be my sibling, but they are like my sibling. The only way for someone to be like my sibling is if we've, like, been around each other and our nasty, gross... Like, that's how my sibling knows me, and all of my gross, weird strangeness and still accepts me. That person can hold me accountable in a way that will lead to my growth. Instead of holding me, I don't think it's accountable to say, uh, and I now dispose of you. To me, that's not account for someone. That might be account for a thing, right? I can be accountable to this thing and say that when it's done, I will recycle it in the right way and throw it out. But insofar that a human being is alive, I think they deserve more than, and now I'm going to put you in a box. So accounting for people is different. So there's got to be a relationship, there's got to be enough proximity to then be able to go to somebody and say, hey, this is what I'm observing. This is how I've experienced what you did. It hurt. It hurt a lot of people. And now something's got to change. Together, we can figure that out. Um, but it's not going to stay the same. And you're still worthy of love. 
and you're still worthy of being who you are. I'm not throwing you out. Even though something's got to change. You will not be in that position anymore. You will not have the power that you have. As an American, I love that we can say what we think. It is what it is. How can you not watch that as an American and, and be disappointed? I knew the people from my town were nuts. You might actually be censored. Small groups and secret meetings. The cold civil war. Right? Kind of felt like an insurgency. Patriotism now uh, is aspirational. Hold me accountable in a way that will lead to my growth.